Welcome back everybody to another reaction video. Well, first, before we get into this, um, big apologies to everybody that I did put a post up on the community area of the channel, but for anyone that didn't see it, um, apologies that there was no video yesterday. What had actually happened is I had recorded um, the first two parts of my reaction to this video that we're doing today, which is Epic History TV's The Decemberists Revolt. Uh, which I know has been requested quite um, quite a lot, um, particularly by a, a, a particular um, user. I can't remember their name. I'm so, so sorry if you're the one that's been requesting this um, for so long. It's finally here, so um, I hope that it's um, something good. I hope you enjoy it, and I hope it's what you wanted. But I know it's been requested by a few other people too, but there's been one in particular that's been very kind of... Um, uh, stalwart in pushing this one, so um, I hope it's enjoyable. But what had actually happened is I'd recorded uh, parts one and two of uh, our reaction to this, came to edit it, realised that the microphone had not been working the entire time, so I got absolutely no voiceover whatsoever. So what I'm going to do is we're going to get part one today, uh, we're going to get part two tomorrow, um, instead of waiting throughout the rest of the week. And then there's also going to be a special on Monday, which is Kings and Generals just put out a new video on Ukraine, which is around, I think it's something to do with naval supremacy of the Black Sea area. So that's going to come out on Monday. So we're going to get three videos in a row this week. And then we're going to look at part two of the Decemberist Revolt on Wednesday and Friday. So uh, we're going to get a few extra videos this week to make up for that. So uh, apologies again, but hopefully this will make up for it. So um, this isn't an entirely blind reaction in that sense. Um, so what I'll do is instead of trying to affect, you know, a, a thing of, you know, oh, I just found this out and it's interesting, you know, from the video, I'll just try and kind of put in what my commentary was, but just say like, you know, oh, when I did the reaction first, you know, I, you know, thought this, this, and this kind of thing. Um, you know, particularly if any of my initial comments may have changed in some way. So, um, but anyway, either way, it should be an interesting look because like I said, like I said in, um, when I recorded this initially, I know next to nothing about the Decemberist Revolt. I know pretty much nothing about what it was. The only major revolt I know of in Russia was um, basically the Russian Civil War, uh, which came out, you know, as sparked just after Russia's defeat in, in the First World War. So um, I know pretty much nothing about this. So, you know, a lot of it is still going to be pretty fresh. So hopefully it's, it's decent. But before we get into this, um, as always, please leave a like and some comments. Um, comment something for the algorithm gods. Uh, it is helping. We are we did push um, just over 300 subscribers before Christmas uh, last year now, uh, which was a good little Christmas present. So thank you so much to everybody that subscribed to the channel and continues to support the channel. Um, please, as always, make sure that there's... Um, there's a link to my Patreon in the description. I'm hoping to build up a community on there as well. Um, the more people that I get there, the more time I'll be able to devote to this channel because uh, obviously at the moment, this channel is just something of a side thing for me. So if I can start to turn it into a job of sorts, you know, I'll be able to put out more content um, because I'll have the financial backing essentially to do that. So um, there are several tiers on Patreon, but um, you know, as, that community hopefully uh, grows, I'll be able to put more stuff into the tiers, you know, more perks and, and things like that. But um, please check that out as well. Um, there are tiers from, I think, like this, I've not looked, I actually looked at my Patreon for a while, but I think like the, the cheapest tier is something like £2 a month or something like that. So it's, it's not a lot, but it's, you know, it, if I can get a lot of people on there, then um, hopefully it will uh, build a community there. I, I may do a separate video on Patreon and just pin it to the channel so people are aware of it. But um, also, as always, please check out Epic History TV. There'll be a link to their channel and the original video in the description. Please go show them some support and love because I've made this point in many other reaction videos to Epic History TV, but they are, in my opinion, the best history documentary channel on YouTube. Um, the quality they put out is just outstanding. So please go check them out too. But let's just dive straight in. So this is Epic History TV, The Decemberists, part one. 1815. 
At the Battle of Waterloo, French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte suffers his final defeat, and two decades of war in Europe come to an end. The victorious powers, led by Austria, Britain, Prussia and Russia, meet at Vienna to decide the fate of Europe. The frontiers of nations and empires are redrawn, while Emperor Alexander of Russia adds King of Poland to his list of titles. He also oversees creation of a holy alliance to ensure that no more revolutions threaten Europe's established order. That's an interesting point to bring up, and I think that's what's probably going to set the stage for all this, because um, one thing that I pointed out in my original recording to this was that um, the war against Napoleon, in or at least the initial war against the nascent French Republic, which came, which obviously then transitioned into becoming the Napoleonic French Empire, um, one of the main reasons for most of these European monarchies declaring war against the French Republic was essentially just self-preservation, because most, if not all, apart that there was only one exception, which was the Dutch Republic. I think there may have been other republics, but that was like the major republic in Europe at the time. Um, so for a major power like France to not only abolish its monarchy, but execute the monarch and his family, um, and replace that order with a republican system which was much more meritocratic and egalitarian. Um, all the other powerful countries in Europe at the time were all monarchies. So to then have them um, not take action, it you know it would have risked spreading these revolutions to their own nations. And obviously that was something that they were completely terrified of was, um, the French exporting the revolution to other countries and exporting these ideas and ideals to different countries and for the, the, the people in those countries to then think, well, actually, they've got a point, you know, um, we probably should get rid of our own monarchy and take, you know, and take power just as the French have done, um, which is what happens with revolutions. You know, after the American Revolution, American revolutionaries exported their ideas, you know, and the French Revolution was essentially a knock-on effect, but in in part, anyway, it wasn't the only cause by any means, but it was a knock-on effect, philosophically at least, of the American Revolution, and indeed had been driven by uh, many leading revolutionaries that were in America. You know, Thomas Jefferson, for example, was um, one of the early figures in fermenting the philosophy of the French Revolution, but um, we might be able to get back into that later. The Russian Empire, after many great sacrifices in the wars against Napoleon, emerges more powerful than ever. But not everyone in Russia is pleased with the new state of affairs. A group of young army officers dream of a different future for Russia. A new form of government, radical reforms, even a Russia without a Tsar. And it's interesting as well that the army is the one to kind of instigate this. Um, and there may have been some feeling of, you know, um, the Congress of Vienna that had concluded the Napoleonic Wars and basically redrew the map of Europe. It was essentially a return to the status quo for the most part. You know, there are obviously some big differences. For example, Russia subsuming the Duchy of Warsaw, which, you know, then became... Um, a component kingdom of Poland under, under the Russian Empire. Um, you know, so there were there were some big changes like that, but for the most part, you know, it was essentially status quo antebellum, you know, in, in many ways. It was because they were trying to preserve the established order as much as they possibly could. So there certainly would have been resentment among some soldiers who were thinking, well, what the hell was the point? You know, what was the point in fighting this bloody war, you know, if we're just going to return to business as usual, you know, so there's always that kind of sort of resentment, you know, and um, a parallel to that would be the English Civil War. Um, but from what I remember from my initial reaction, there's a part where I can get into that later, so I'll save that for now. This video is sponsored by NordVPN. 
These days, more and more people are using a VPN for a more secure and enjoyable internet experience. A VPN encrypts your internet traffic and hides your location, protecting you from unwanted surveillance, data theft, and malware attacks. It also opens up access to sites and services that may be blocked in your location. NordVPN gives you all this and more with simple one-click or automatic connection on up to six devices on all major platforms. They have thousands of servers in 60 countries, ensuring you can connect anonymously and take advantage of the best content and offers from around the globe. If you're worried all this might slow down your connection, speed tests confirm that NordVPN is currently the fastest VPN available. We have a brilliant deal for Epic History TV viewers, a 61% discount if you sign up using nordvpn.com slash epichistorytv, or just click the link in the video description. Plus, there's a 30-day money-back guarantee for peace of mind. Thanks to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. In 1812, Napoleon had invaded Russia with the largest army Europe had ever seen. It was a defining moment in his reign. But he underestimated Russian resolve. Four months later, the remnants of his army began its infamous retreat from Moscow. The Russian army and its coalition allies then drove Napoleon's forces back across Europe fighting giant battles in Germany, and finally arriving in the streets of Paris itself. Napoleon's abdication was a moment of triumph for Emperor Alexander and for Russia. For many young Russian officers, it was also an eye-opening experience. Imperial Russia was an autocracy, ruled by an emperor with no checks upon his power. There was no political opposition or constitution. There was no freedom of speech or right to trial. Approximately 80%... Just think of that for a moment, because um, even no right to trial, you know, that had been something that had been kind of embedded in um, English uh, legal culture since, you know, the 13th century, you know, the with the advent of some of things like the Magna Carta and the Charter of the Forest and things like that, um, which forced, which essentially transitioned the English monarchy away from being arguably an absolutist monarchy towards a constitutional monarchy. It was like that, the first step on that ladder. It didn't really become a the constitutional monarchy we think of today until really after the Glorious Revolution. Um, that was kind of like the form it took in its current form, but just think of that, just think of how comparatively far behind um, the Russian society was compared to the rest of Europe, especially when you've got something like France, which just came out with these hugely revolutionary ideals. You know, it took the ideas of that triggered the American Revolution and then expanded on them to a large degree. Um, you know, and then Napoleon, you know, um, in many ways he was a betrayal of the ideas of the French Revolution, you know, the, the idea that it was a monarchy for one thing. Um, but also, what we also have to recognise is that his conquests also helped to spread these ideas, because while it was in some ways a betrayal of the ideas of the French Revolution, in other ways he also carried a lot of them forward too. And in the countries that France conquered, what you ended up with was Napoleon installing puppet regimes. And by doing so, it was directly influenced by the ideals of the, of the revolution. So you got these wholesale changes taking place. And these ideas were being exported pretty much across the entirety of Europe, right up to the Russian border, because we see that countries like Prussia eventually ended up allied um, with France. So you had these ideas spreading even further east. And, you know, once you also have the Russian army marching through the streets of Paris, you know, you'll have invariably discussions taking place between soldiers and, you know, um, the middle class of French society that helped fan the flames of the revolution to begin with. So they're going to be returning home with um, these ideas. And, you know, and 
the ideas themselves, you know, especially to an autocratic regime, you know, people living under an autocratic regime like Russia at the time, they would have seen them, you know, as like, you know, well, this doesn't actually sound half bad, you know, what were we fighting for, essentially. So it turns that resentment around onto um, the Russian regime. The intent of Russians were serfs, peasants with no rights, freedom or hope of betterment, their status passed down to their children. Hmm. Just a quick note on serfdom as well. So serfdom in Russia was essentially slavery in all but name. So serfdom was a holdover from the, fe the medieval feudal system. And the feudal system, you could broadly define it as um, landowners would rent their land uh, to tenants, and the tenants would repay that, not initially, not in money, but in um, service and loyalty. So things like when that lord needed to, say, defend their lands against, you know, um, an opposing, you know, hostile neighbor or bandits or whatever, um, they would expect that you, as a tenant, would you know, serve in their military force, in their army, you know, so that was the initial way that people repaid service. And it wasn't until pretty much after the 14th century where you got the things like the Black Death that caused wholesale, you know, rescaling of society, that you got an emerging middle class that, you know, steadily became wealthier. And what they could then afford to do was say, you know what, I'm not going to serve in your military, but I will pay you, I'll give you money. Um, as rent, essentially, as payment for my tenancy. And that's pretty much where we get the modern system of tenancy from, you know, where you pay a landlord rent to use their property, essentially. You know, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, but in Russia, it was completely different. So in Russia, serfs were... So in, like, a that form of feudalism that I described was the one that was pretty much predominant across most of Europe. Um, obviously, it had different flavours depending on which country you were in. Um, but that was broadly what it was. But as a person, you were essentially free. You know, you could move about. In Russia, it was completely different. So in Russia, the serfs were tied to the land. So if, say, for example, I'm a Russian aristocrat in the 19th century, I own, you know, a big tract of land and there's 600 serfs living on it. But then I decide, you know what, I've had enough of this. I don't want to deal with this anymore. I'm going to go emigrate somewhere else and start a new life in America, you know, whatever. So I sell the land. Um, some other aristocrat buys the land off me. They don't just get the land. They also get all those 600 serfs because the serfs are tied to the land. So it was slavery in all but name. And it was a very sort of much stricter form as well in, in some ways because of that, because the serfs came with the land, essentially. And that pretty much continued up until the early 20th century. You know, Russia didn't really get rid of serfdom until after the Bolshevik Revolution. The inefficiency, not to mention injustice, of such a system was increasingly apparent even to many Russian aristocrats. In Europe, serving as officers in the Russian army They'd visited countries where serfdom had been swept aside by war and revolution, and where monarchs had granted constitutions that limited their power, protected freedoms, and acknowledged the rule of law. Many were inspired and began to dream of similar reforms in Russia. But few placed faith in Emperor Alexander to aid their cause. On the night of the 11th of March, 1801, Alexander's father, Emperor Paul, was strangled to death by a group of disaffected army officers. Alexander succeeded to the throne, aged just 23. The ineffectiveness and chaos of his father's rule had appalled him. In 1797, he'd written to his tutor, to speak plainly, the well-being of the state is not at all considered in the administration of affairs. There is only absolute power, which does everything wrong and at cross-purposes. The choice of officials is entirely a matter of favouritism. Merit counts for nothing. 
the farmer is plagued, commerce is hindered, personal liberty and well-being are reduced to nothing. There you have the picture of Russia. Judge how my heart must suffer. The young Alexander displayed a great enthusiasm for reform, an encouraging sign to Russian aristocrats who wished to see a more modern Russian state. In 1803, he passed... And that's the other thing as well, which is that um, middle class and aristocracy are usually the ones that can afford to travel, they're usually the best educated, so they're the ones that are, you know, gathering new ideas, and those are the ones that generally fan the flames of revolution in many countries. It was true in America, it was true in France, you know, it's been true, you know, even in the USSR, the, you know, the what you know, the uh, Bolsheviks that predated it, they were essentially the, the middle class that were the educated, learned ones. Um, and that's not at all surprising that um, that they would want Russia to keep pace because um, when they look at the rest of Europe, which is flourishing under these new systems, they think, well, perhaps there's some merit to that. You know, we should adopt these traits and, you know, because we need to keep pace with our neighbours, otherwise we're, we're just going to, you know, completely collapse into obscurity and nothingness. And that's not something that's at all surprising. You know, if anyone's familiar with the history of Ataturk, who was the the man who basically fought, helped to form the modern, what we think of as the modern state of Turkey, um, out of the remnants of the Ottoman Empire, um, he was pretty much the same. You know, he looked at the Ottoman Empire and Turkey in particular and thought, you know, this is just a completely outdated, outmoded system, you know, and he had visited, you know, France, Germany. I think he'd also been to Britain as well. So he had seen what um, systems were working really, really well in other parts of Europe and thought, you know, Turkey needs to adopt a lot of this if it wants to survive, if it wants to modernize and be, you know, taken seriously on the national and the international stage. So it's not at all surprising that these changes, uh, calls for change, were coming from the aristocracy as well, because they the ones that stand to lose the most prestige and wealth and status out of all of this. Passed a decree that gave landowners the right to free their serfs. Many hoped it was a first step towards the abolition of serfdom. In 1808, the brilliant and liberal-minded Mikhail Speransky became Alexander's chief advisor. He created a new council of state to advise the emperor, and even began working on a Russian constitution. But in 1812, Alexander's appetite for reform ended abruptly. First, an anti-reform faction, led by the Emperor's sister, Grand Duchess Ekaterina Pavlovna, engineered Speransky's dismissal. Then, Napoleon invaded Russia. In this moment of supreme crisis, Alexander was seized by religious fervor, a sense of personal mission and national destiny. Which also isn't that at all surprising either, because, um, you know, it's it's not uncommon for when in times of great crisis, especially something like this, you know, you've got the largest army that Europe has ever seen coming across your border, something like 600,000 men. And to put that into perspective, the Roman Empire at its height, all of its legions and auxiliary units together, they fielded about 450,000 or so, maybe 480,000. And that was across the entire empire. That was an empire that stretched from Mesopotamia to Scotland. You know, it was a huge empire. And here we've got, you know, um, another third on top of that invading one country. You know, that's not accounting for the armies that Napoleon has across France, Italy, and especially in Spain as well at this time. So that's you know, an absolutely enormous army. And this is an army that's the vanguard of these revolutionary ideals, you know. Um, so perhaps from Alexander's perspective, it was a case of, well, you know, um, these ideals are what led to this country invading us in the first place. You know, um, obviously it wasn't strictly the case, but if you've got, um, if you're wanting to enact change, and then you've got another army that's coming across the border, that's already implemented a lot of these pretty very similar changes you know perhaps there was also paranoia in alexander's mind of thinking you know would my people be more 
you know, inclined to support Napoleon in that case. Um, so it's not surprising that he kind of reverts to this very um, reactionary, it's, also, it's basically reactionary conservatism in a way. It's, you know, and, and that's not surprising either, which is when you get these very progressive liberal revolutions, you invariably get conservative counter-revolutions um, from people that don't want that change. Um, you know, that's a truth throughout history as well. You know, every revolution's had that. So it's not surprising that he would revert to a kind of form of traditionalism to try and unify the country together under a sense of national purpose to repel the French invader. The burning of Moscow, he declared, had illuminated his soul. Liberal reforms, he could now see, were only the road to anarchy and chaos. They were an intolerable risk to Russia's holy institutions. In 1815, any officers returning from Europe harboring hopes of reform were to be severely disappointed. Alexander added insult to injury by granting a liberal constitution not to Russia, but to his new kingdom, Poland. Not one, it turned out, he planned to honour. Three years later, when Alexander raised the possibility of a Russian constitution based on this Polish experiment, it proved an empty promise. Idealistic young officers, more alienated than ever, decided that if the Emperor would not take up their cause, they must act themselves. They began to organise secret societies, and to plan a revolution. Many Russian military officers already belonged to a secret society. Freemasonry had been imported from Europe in the 18th century and was popular among army officers. But in 1816, officers from Russia's prestigious Guards regiments, based in St. Petersburg, formed a new secret society, the Union of Salvation. Four of its founding members would play a leading role in a revolutionary movement that became known as the Decemberists. Nikita Muravyov, a captain in the Guards Division staff, aged 31 at the time of the Decemberists' revolt. He would draft one of their major plans for constitutional reform. Can I just say as well, um, I pointed this out in the initial review that I recorded, but this is just a small note, it's a comment more on the aesthetics of the video than anything, but I really like that little effect where they've they've run that image of the the figures through some kind of filter, you know, it, it's kind of like it, maybe an app of some kind, I don't know how they've really done that, but they've got it so the face is slightly animated, and it just brings an extra depth of life, I think, to what it is you're looking at, rather than just looking at a painting or a portrait of them, it kind of adds an extra dimension to them and it's it's really interesting because I don't think I've seen any other History Channel do that. I'm sure there's been one, but um, this is the first time that I've, I've seen something like that used. Um, and it's a really neat little thing, it just adds a bit of extra life to what you're seeing. Um, even if sometimes it does look like they fell down the uncanny valley. Um, <laughs> but it is good, I do like it. Lieutenant Colonel Sergei Muravyov Apostol, aged 30 at the time of the revolt. He would lead the Decemberist uprising in Ukraine. Colonel Prince Sergei Trubitskoy, aged 36 at the time of the revolt. A war hero from one of Russia's most distinguished families, Trubitskoy would be chosen to lead the Decemberist coup in St. Petersburg. And Colonel Pavel Pestel of the Vyatka Infantry Regiment, aged 33 at the time of the revolt. Also a decorated war hero, badly wounded at Borodino. He was a brilliant, if uncompromising, officer and one of the most active and radical members of the Union. He would argue for the Emperor's death and creation of a Russian Republic. The Union of Salvation soon merged with another secret society, the Order of Russian Knights to form the Union of Prosperity, with more than 200 members. 
Its charter, known as the Green Book, set out how the Union was to be organised. It also spelled out its commitment to educating the public about Enlightenment ideals of virtuous moral citizenship. This, it was hoped, would generate wider support for reform among Russia's elite. Only a trusted... Not just in the elite either, but also across, you know, a broader cross-section of society in that sense. So comparing this to something like the American Revolution, which when you think of New England at the time, New England had one of, if not the highest standard of living in the world at the time of the American Revolution. Um, and that was largely in part thanks to the Puritans' ideology, um, because they had a very, very strong commitment to education. Their take on it was so that people could um, educate themselves on matters of faith and religion, but it also produced a very, very literate class of people. Um, the literacy rate in New England, for example, I think was something like 99%. It was ridiculously high, especially for the time. Um, most people could read and write, um, which means if you can read and write, you can be educated, you know, and if you can be educated, then you can, you know, be, uh, you're more receptive to, um, ideas for change and things like that, because it's the educated people that mingle, you know, and exchange ideas and philosophies and things like that. And that was basically the purpose of most of these secret societies, which was to disseminate information and ideas. Did inner circle was privy to the Union's more radical, long-term goals of securing a constitution and ending serfdom. leaders of the Union of Prosperity were wise to be wary. Alexander had tightened censorship laws, while allies kept him informed about Russia's supposedly secret societies. For the moment, he tolerated them, telling one courtier, You who have served me since the beginning of my reign know that I have shared and encouraged all these dreams and delusions. It is not for me to be strict. His new closest advisor, General Alexei Arakchev, felt no such restraint. Arakchev had masterminded the organization of Russian artillery during the Napoleonic Wars, and was famed for ruthless efficiency, a violent temper, and absolute loyalty to the Emperor. He loathed almost anything to do with Western Europe. You don't get things done by talking softly in French, he once remarked. That's interesting as well, because even today, when you look, if anyone's been keeping tabs on the war in Ukraine, um, some of the language that Russian propagandists are using on their channels back in Russia, um, they seem to echo similar sentiments, which is that there seems to be, I don't know if anyone that perhaps is from Russia um, or has more intimate knowledge of that society can comment on this in the comments. Um, but there seems to be, from what I've perceived, um, in, at least in some circles, I don't know how widespread this notion is, but at least in some circles, there seems to be this idea that Russia is sort of neither European nor Asian, despite the fact that the most populated parts of Russia are in Europe. Most of the country itself is in Asia. Um, but there seem, you know, if any, a lot of the language that's been used on these propaganda channels, for example, they seem, they say European as if they're they don't align with thinking of themselves as Europeans. So it's interesting that we've got that here as well, because they're kind of seeing themselves as a separate entity almost. You know, it's um, it's it's almost a case of like, you know, we don't want anything to do with Europe. We're not Europe. You know, we're Russia, essentially. Arakchev was put in charge of the emperor's latest idea, the so-called military settlements. The plan was to cut the cost of Russia's huge army by having soldiers and serfs live side by side in new villages organized like military camps, with strict discipline. It was a harsh policy, even by the standards of Russian autocracy, and led to misery, riots and rising resentment against the regime. Interesting as well, because 
and these aren't remotely comparable. You know, they're not nearly the same thing in any way. But it's interesting because one of the grievances that led to the American, I keep going back to the American Revolution because it's what I know, um, but one of the grievances that led to the American Revolution was particularly um, stationing soldiers around civilian districts. You know, there's an oft-repeated myth, um, I would go so far as to say it is a myth, that soldiers were billeted in people's homes, which isn't strictly true. Um, what they were were billeted in unoccupied property. It wasn't a case of soldiers being you know, forcibly quartered with people that were already living somewhere. Um, that's not what was happening. But um, just the fact that soldiers were stationed in these big cities, like Boston, for example, armies at this time were not uh, were not easy guests at all. You know, I've gone into this on other videos that I've done, but there was a whole myriad of reasons of why soldiers were derided and actively, you know, hated and loathed by civilians. They tended to just be brutish, you know, uh, to, in their treatment of civilians for the most part. Um, you know, they, they were just unruly guests, basically. Um, and it's interesting because we've got a, a much more extreme example of that happening here in Russia as well, um, which is essentially quartering soldiers with civilians. And again, stationing an army in America in um, before the American Revolution was done for the same reason. It was done to try and help cut the costs. Because the idea was, let's station the army in America that we can't demobilize because they're all politically well connected. So let's put it in America and have the Americans pay for them. Um, you know, it's kind of a similar situation, but to a much more extreme example here. So it's interesting that we've got kind of like those parallels happening. Arakchev also enforced strict new standards of discipline and conduct in the army. The soldiers who had defeated Napoleon were now subjected to endless parades and inspections. Small infractions were brutally punished. Officers who spoke out on behalf of their men were dismissed. In 1820, a protest by the Semyonovsky Lifeguard Regiment, one of the army's senior units, led to even more savage punishments. To the Decembrist leaders, it proved that even elite regiments had fallen out of love with the regime. They themselves would be acting in a strong Russian tradition of palace coups led by army officers to secure dynastic and political change. The crucial task was to be ready when the moment came. Not all that dissimilar from the Praetorian Guard in the Roman Empire. You know, the Praetorian Guard essentially became the kingmakers of Rome for quite a long time. Um, until they were disbanded by, I think it was Constantine, Constantine the Great, who disbanded the Praetorian Guard. Um, but the Praetorian Guard had a similar tradition as well of, you know, getting rid of emperors they didn't like. Um, but it's interesting to see that kind of treatment of the veteran regiments that had defeated Napoleon, because um, from their perspective, they would have been thinking, well, you know, we had fought hard to defeat Napoleon, and what's our reward? Being subjected to parade after parade after parade and if we've got a button missing you know or you know some dust on our jackets then we get fiercely reprimanded what kind of a reward is that so of course it's going to drive resentment towards the regime Okay, so we've got to another break in the chapters and we're just over halfway in, so I think we'll leave it there for now, um, which is where I put a break in the original recording. So we'll come back tomorrow with part two and I'll look at part one <laughs> of the Decembrist Revolution. Um, and that'll be up at the same time tomorrow. It'll be 3 p.m. Uh, GMT as standard. So um, please make sure that you're subscribed and notifications are on so you don't miss that and all the other videos that we've got coming out in the future. And in the meantime, thanks so much for watching and I shall see you all on the next one.